Can you beat every shrine in Breath of the Wild without the Sheikah Slate? It's the first thing you pick up on a new save and the entire game is designed around you using it. But this run isn't as simple as playing the game without it in your inventory. Even when Link doesn't have the Slate, he can still use runes, so let's go over the rules of this run. First, I can't pick up the Slate, ever. Second, I can't use any runes for anything inside a shrine or not. Third, I'm banning the use of apparatuses. Fourth, terminals to enter shrines are completely banned. And, to make it more fun, Moon Jump is banned while inside of shrines. These rules all apply only to the save I'm doing the run on, as I need a second save to even set this up and make it possible. So, how do we skip the slate? I'll link a video to Gaming Reinvented's tutorial on this, but here's a quick summary. Creator uses a save file that's beaten the plateau, has the camera rune, and has an apparatus shrine unlocked. Next, create a new save, but do not move and let the game autosave. Return to your other save and enter an apparatus shrine. I used Miyamagana, but others will work fine too. Trigger the walk with camera glitch and interact with an apparatus, which will also take a picture. Delete the picture and pause quickly before the game gives you control of the apparatus. Watch a memory and then exit your menu. You should be able to control Link now and the apparatus at the same time. Jump off the edge and load your other save right as Link starts to void out. It'll take a little bit to load, but when it does, you'll void out a couple of times and load in outside of the Shrine of Resurrection. Now that we're outside without the slate, there's a couple of things to note about what happens when you skip it. The minus menu is gone, we can't teleport, we're missing part of the HUD, and the time will be permanently stuck at 5.15am. Since the time doesn't move, you won't get nights or blood moons, but we'll revisit this later. For now, let's begin. To start the plateau off, let's complete Oadime. Since we can't use the terminals to enter shrines, we need to clip in using shield clipping. If you're not familiar with how to clip, there are quite a few tutorials online and we'll need it for every shrine. For the plateau shrines, we're still forced to pick up the runes, otherwise the monk will let us complete the shrine. After you've acquired the rune, use a couple of shield jumps to get onto and off of the rotating platform. We can use the same method at the end to just barely skip the ball. I'll throw a counter up top, cause this will be quite the long run. Ken the Mutt will be the last shrine clip I show, but if you're interested in how I clipped a specific one, feel free to message me or drop a comment below. Once you're inside, you want to try to position the platform by using bomb arrows to rotate it into place. Now we can use a speedrunning trick to get over this gate, since the other path is blocked without Cryonis. This one might take you a few tries to get correct, but you'll eventually get it. Now on to a much harder shrine. Drop a save when you get inside of Old Man Owl because you'll need to walk back outside to set some skew. Load back inside because you'll need to clip through the double wall in front. Unfortunately, there's no way to move the two Magnesis stores at the beginning with the resources we can get at this point in the game. Use Bomb Arrows as a Magnesis substitute to clear the path forward. Fend off the Guardian and then shield jump across the gap you're supposed to use the door for. This part's a bit tricky. You'll need to knock down the chest and position it so that you can get skew that will clip you through the final wall. If you're not familiar with skew, basically when you get it, you need to get it in the direction facing the wall you want to clip through. Because the first wall wasn't the same direction as this one, we had to reset our skew. But alas, we did make it to the end of the shrine. Jawbodge doesn't have much noteworthy to show since we can break all the blocks with either a hammer or a bomb arrow. Now that we're done the plateau, I'll feature the shrines in the order that I completed them on run. One thing to know before we just free roam is that you'll want to pick up as many Octo Balloons as you possibly can. One other thing worth your time is getting a Horus. Moving across the overworld is pretty slow and we don't have the menu to teleport, so you'll be grateful for the faster travel. On to Rota O. On the left side of the shrine, you'll find a chest that contains a key. Grab it and head back to the start. Throw the orb in the catch and then unlock the door with the key you just got. You can hit the trigger with your bow and arrow, which will then unlock your route to the top. Grab the chest, rotate the platform back to normal, and then you can simply walk to the monk's chamber. Cam you talk. I should have mentioned earlier that you also want a lot of bomb arrows. For this, if you can time your shots when it's moving forward, you'll increase its momentum and it'll eventually knock the door open. The next section wants you to use Magnesis, but if you time it right, you can totally just run past. After freeing the bowling ball with a fire arrow, you should be able to continue to the next area. Throw a barrel in a corner, pull out some octo balloons, and you should be able to pile it upwards. You're really just wanting to go to this switch here, so feel free to hop off earlier. Once you're up, continue to the next shrine. 
Bosch Cola never required runes, so just use your paraglider like normal and follow the winds to the end. Lago Kata doesn't have much to work with, but luckily we have a simple solution. Climb on top the middle blocks and drop two Octobloons. Try to pilot it with your Korok Leaf if you can, but you should be able to just glide to the exit. Inside of Flower Blight's domain is Hill Aral. Hop on top of a raft and throw a few Octobloons to get on top of the walls. Usually, if you get on top of the walls, you have a pretty clear path to the Monk's Chamber. Takatus was quite the challenge. Hop into the water and push one of the orbs against a wall by swimming into it slowly. Use an Octobloon to fish it out of the water, or use some bomb arrows, but I found those to be much more scarce. To get it into the pedestal, use a couple of Octobloons to lift it into the air. Guide with an arrow or two to push over top, and let the balloon timer run out. This will unlock the door to the next area where we're going to rinse and repeat the same process. However, this time we have a door blocking it from going in. If you have skew, you can start to clip in and the doors will open. This works because the game has a failsafe to keep you from getting locked inside the cage, and Link is technically there during the skew frames. Now that the water's gone, you can simply walk to the inn. Talo Nog is next since it's nearby. I won't showcase the fights for Test of Strength Shrine since they're all solved the same way and it would be quite repetitive. For our first shrine quest, let's tackle Mezalo. This quest is simple, only requiring us to retrieve a stag and bring it to this pedestal. Once you clip in and enter, make your way over to this ramp. If you shield jump and glide, you can just barely cross this gap. Look back and shoot the switch to rotate the column to the next spot. Instead of using the chest on the switch, place down an item like wood or flint to open the door. Back onto the ramp from the start, use the switch again to rotate the platform to the exit. You can clear the final gap like the first one with a shield jump, rolling our counter to 12. Make sure you have fire arrows before Ruko Mog. You can light all these torches with them, barring the one blocked by the jet of water. These switches can be hit with arrows or weapons, allowing us to complete the five flames easily. For Shai Yota, you'll want to grab a sledgehammer for somewhere to break the rocks that block the drafts creating the wind path. Since it's raining here, bomb arrows are off limits. Also, because this is our first blessing shrine, I'll just mention that I won't show the insides of these since there's no puzzle and their interiors are all identical minus the chest. Our next blessing shrine is Jatan Sami, which can be completed like normal. Defeat the dragon, drop a scale in the spring, then clip in for an easy orb. Tano O is another blessing shrine and easily revealed with your sledgehammer or a bomb arrow. Nyamagana is our first apparatus shrine. Go up to the apparatus and aim between the bars with a bomb arrow. If you hit the orb with a duplex bow at the right angle, it should fall into a walkway somewhere. If not, reload and retry until you get an angle that works. Once it's out, you can simply push it into the pedestal to complete the shrine. The three boxes shrine actually only requires one box. Head over to the moving platform with a chest on it and pull out some items. If you run into a metal chest like this while holding items, you can move it. Once it's in the corner, use some octobloons to ride it up, jumping if needed. Other two boxes not included. Make a pit stop for Hestu's maracas and return them. We'll need to expand our inventory for some later shrines, but for now let's keep going. Ridahi never required runes to solve it as normal. Though if you want the chest at the end, a shield jump is enough to retrieve it. She, Vanath, and Veneer will count at the same time. Nether requires ruins and have the opposite solutions. Put the orbs in the right pedestals and move on. Totosaw has an interesting solution. The first apparatus can be entirely skipped by shield jumping from the lamps. The second is also skipped with a shield jump landing on the rail. Climb up the stairs and one more jump to make it across. Now for the final part where I found something interesting. These stairs slide on the rail they're attached to and work with runes like stasis or move with gravity. However, octobloons can apparently lift them as well. Now we need the key for the exit. If you glide down and stand on the lower torch, you can open the chest. Void out to get back up, repeat the step with the stairs, and now make a shield jump from this ramp to just barely clear it to the exit. Now our path to the monk's chamber is open, completing number 22. For the three Hinoxes near Taran Pass, simply steal the orb from them. There's no need to fight them since you can run off before they can get you. Take them up to their pedestals to unlock Tawa Jin, another blessing shrine. Clip in and move on. Ya Ren has a similar solution to my last video. Push the metal block against the left wall, though the right would work fine too. Use Octa Balloons to get on top of the wall and then walk to the end. If you can get on the walls of most shrines, they're pretty much as easy as this one to clear, allowing you to simply walk to the end and skip the puzzles. Mu Ojin and Chas Keta are tests of strength with no quit, so let's bump the counter. I was glitch hunting during this segment and made a sidetrack for the Blessing Shrine to Kulo. I wanted the travel medallion, but I wound up not needing it, so don't do this if you're following along. 
use a bomb arrow to reveal the entrance to Shai Uto. For the first two seesaw ramps, you can use a shield jump to get past instead of the intended stasis. For the last double ramp, use items or campfires to weigh down the first ramp, and try to shield jump to or past the middle of the second one. Our next shrine is a blessing. Kukanata is easily revealed by dropping a metallic weapon and waiting for a lightning strike. Shodasa is soft like normal. Grab one of the orbs and launch it with the right timing into the pedestals on each side. Grab the key and take it to unlock the monk's chamber for shrine number 30. Cal Maka begins with a door. Keep throwing Octobloons at it to nudge it open until you can walk or clip through. It is possible to clip without using the balloons, but it's quite difficult. Once on the left of the shrine, knock down the door and pilot it upwards. Once you're at the peak of your height, you should be able to just make it to the end. Nearby is another test of strength shrine, Pu Magneta, for an easy orb. My next choice was Yanaga. If you don't have a triple shot bow, go get one. Get on the block and aim down with a bomb arrow. With the right angle, the blast will shoot you just to the top of the shrine without the bomb room. Moglaton has one of my favorite solutions from this run. Start by making your way past the bridge. Note that you can lower the bridge, but I wanted to save arrows. Shoot the spike balls with bomb arrows to make them swing away from the walkway. Now that they are swinging, you should be free to maneuver your way past them and onto the stairs that lead to the end. This last section wants you to use Magnesis to create a staircase, but we're going to do it a different way. If you get behind the metal steps and slam them with bomb arrows, you can position them to move into place. You can keep repeating this jump and using bomb arrows until you get the steps moved into place. Once you do, make your way to the end for the final door. You can use any source of fire to clear these leaves, but I had a flame blade, so it was my go-to. Now that the barricade on the door is gone, it can be forced open with bomb arrows, completing the shrine. While we're at the Bridge of Hylia, let's rest. If you know the 5.15 AM locations of each dragon, you can locate them by camping. Acquiring ferocious scale like this completes one more blessing shrine for us, Shei Katha. Bravery's Grasp, Ishtoso. By hitting this crystal, we can move the pillars on the far wall. Glide on over to them and slowly make your way to the side close to the exit using arrows to create your path. Once you get over to the last segment, you can hop on top of the lamps and shield surf up each step. Once you're up, that's shrine complete. Next stop, Dilamog, is a free orb since it's a blessing shrine. Also a blessing shrine is Mise Suma, which is made a lot easier by clipping in since we don't need to complete the quest. Kano is solved as normal. This shrine might have originally intended for you to use Magnesis, but you can carry the orbs everywhere you need to go, making this one an easy task. Dakachise is also quite simple, but might take a retry or two. On the left side, there's a large metal block. Throw a single octobloon on one side and hop on top as it rotates. Once on top, drop a second octobloon for additional height, clearing your way to the exit. Number 41, Dakota. The first step of the shrine is to move a metal power block. Ride the platform over to grab it and then tight walk back. We're supposed to use Magnesis to retrieve it, but that's off limits and why we're testing our balance. The block to power the elevator up, granting us access to the next area, which has even more Magnesis objects. The major one blocking our path can be moved with bomb arrows or other explosive means. Now that the block is out of our way, we can ride the elevator to the top, where the monk wants us to power a platform with the block we've been carrying. Of course, they won't give up on us using Magnesis. Hopefully you're still collecting all the bomb arrows everywhere, because we're going to need plenty more. For number 42, grab an easy orb from Da Kasso's Test of Strength. At this point, I made a trek out to the Korok Woods to grab the Master Sword. You can grab it early by resting at a campfire while looking at the sky near the sword. Smash the A button really fast after confirming your rest and you should pick it up. Tutorial link below. While we're at the Korok Woods, I should mention you want to upgrade your bow stash quite a lot. If you haven't been collecting Korok seeds, it's a good time to start. You want around 10 to 12 bow slots for later shrines, but feel free to upgrade the other inventories too. After you're done with Hestu, we'll complete one of the four shrines in Korok Forest. Kyo Rug is as simple as placing these orbs in the correct pedestal. The other three shrines we'll revisit later. Next is Zaltawa. This one never required runes, so complete it like normal and move on. You can also complete Shim de Goes like normal, as both the shrine quest and the inside of the shrine are normally done without runes. I re-recorded Shim de Goes during editing to feature an easier skip. The ball on the right side can be shot with bomb arrows while in the air to knock it off its pillar. It should roll directly into the pedestal, but feel free to retry and reload if it doesn't. 
After that, you can launch up and fire an arrow to unlock the door leading you to the exit. On to the storming area with Toyasa. To unlock the shrine, we need to take these orbs to the center island. Start by throwing it off and carrying it up to the wall. Use octobaloons to raise the orbs into the air and arrows to push them so that they fall down onto the island. Climb on top and carry the orbs to the center to place them in the correctly colored pedestal. There is one more orb like this one and it can be moved to the island the same way. Afterwards, all four should be at the island and once placed, they'll unlock Toyasa. Once inside, you'll want to break the blocks near the entrance with a bomb arrow. There's a magnesis block underneath that we can fly upwards. However, we can't actually get high enough with a single set of octobloons. Drop another set mid-flight to get up higher, and Link should be able to paraglide over the exit cage easily. Number 48, Mog Nora, is a blessing revealed with a single bomb arrow. Depending on how you normally solve Monyotoma, you may do this one without runes. These boxes are the only spot that might require them, but a fire or bomb arrow will clear them out where you normally might use a remote bomb. Once they've been broken, you can carry the orb and hit the switches like normal, propelling you to the exit. Runakachta is our 50th shrine and another blessing without a puzzle. Worth noting though is that the guardians protecting it can simply be glided through instead of actually fighting them all, making this one a lot easier than it might at first look. Rin Oya is featuring the same skip as my last challenge run. Grab at least three octobaloons and ride a magnesis block up until you can paraglide your way to the exit. Number 52, Gihara can be entered like normal by slamming a snowball into the stone door. Once inside, pull out a bow and preferably a regular arrow to knock the hanging stone ball onto its switch. After collecting the chest, return and knock the ball against the right wall from the entrance. You want to push it into a corner and get on top. Use our primary cheese for this run, octobaloons, and then glide to the exit. The Blessing Shrine Lano Ku can be entered and exited by cramming food into Link before the cold kills him. Doom Batag requires you have a multi-shot boat. You can press the switch in the beginning by using bomb arrows until it sinks in, reloading if you use too much ammo. Moving on to the second room, we get to use balloons but in a more creative way. Jump across the gap to the standing rock, place two octo balloons in the center of it to flip it, and the force will press the switch, opening up the exit. Number 55, Tenakosa, is a test of strength without any unique issues. Ka Okio is revealed with an octo balloon instead of magnesis. For the most part, Ka Okio doesn't require runes, so I won't fully cover it due to its length. The only questionable areas are the destructible blocks, which you can substitute bomb arrows for remote bombs. 57, Agvaquo doesn't require runes, so solve like normal. Also solve like normal is Sha Warvo, as no runes were ever required. While we're in the area, it's worth completing Von Meadow, the only divine beast we'll tackle in this run. Your imaginary Sheikah Slate will unlock the terminals around Meadow. It won't go through each terminal, but you can access all with clipping, gliding, or bomb arrows. While Rivali's Gill is useful, we mostly completed the Divine Beast for the Shrine Quest into Vu Lota. Once inside, the shrine doesn't require runes, so solve like normal. Makara presents an interesting challenge for us. Once you get past the first torch door, there's a button on a pillar too high to jump on. Throw down some wood or something heavy and octobaloon it up. Use arrows to position it over and it should fall down on the switch. The boxes ahead can be destroyed with arrows instead of remote bombs, leaving only one challenge left in this shrine. To get past the last bike ball route, crouch and go to a corner. They put a round object in a square walkway and we can certainly abuse that. We'll tack three more test of strength shrines on our counter while we're in the Hebra Mountains. Mozo Shino, Hyamyu, and Goma Asad. Tokuomo is a blessing, but getting in runeless is tricky. The issue is that rolling a snowball from a lower area won't break the door, and we can't use Cryonis to roll it over the hole. If you can get one in the water puddle without breaking it, lift it into the air, and nudge it forward with ice arrows, it should gain enough momentum and grow large enough to break the door. Shadana places a block we can get on top of by flipping with one balloon and riding to the exit with a second one. Rakuag only has one section you might need runes for, but fire is an acceptable alternative. Sha Gemma, another shrine made easy by the use of an octobaloon. Two more blessing shrines to get our counter to 69. Kwazatoki and Keto Wawai are able to be entered as normal. Back into the Korag forest and we find the hardest shrine quest in the run. 
The path to Kunsa Dodge can be navigated without Magnesis through trial and error or online guide. Once you find the shield in the stomp, clear out the enemies, pick up the shield, and then drop the shield while standing in the spot you need to take it. This is where the difficulty actually begins. We need to get a chest out of this tree's mouth and into another tree's mouth across the water. Drop a save because you'll be retrying a lot. Use some bomb arrows to knock the chest out of the first tree. Depending on where it lands, you'll need to pull the raft up and use whatever means you can to get it onto the raft. Sail across the water and be careful finagling it onto the island. If it touches the shore, it's gone. Use shield bashes or any method you can to move it up to the stone in between the torches. Make an updraft just behind the chest and prepare for hell. Octabloon the chest and then jump in the updraft. Use arrows to give the chest momentum forward and then pop one of the balloons when it gets to just the right height. With some luck you'll make it in and unlock the shrine which is as simple as a blessing. This took me entirely too long to figure out and actually execute. The other two shrines left in Korok Forest can be solved as normal, with the only potential exception being crossing this area in Mogalan. In my original playthrough, I climbed the trees, but Rivales is an easy skip as well. 72, Qua Rain, where destroying this chest will lower a box for us to access. Boxes are totally my thing, and Octobloons make yet another easy shrine complete. Miro Shaz, the universally hated shrine and also hated in this run. To get started, you'll want to get the ball over near the goal. Using some octobaloons and bomb arrows, we can get onto the platform, or if you're particularly lucky, it'll go in without another step. Back up near the shrine entrance, we can hop over this gate, which lets us glide to the platform. Once over, you can grab the ball and simply put it in the goal, completing the hardest part of the shrine. The easier part is back past the door we just unlocked. The game intends for you to use stasis, but we can push this block. If you push it while staying on the rail, it'll flip the bridge, granting us access to the exit. Once flipped, you can head back and go up to get to the monk's chamber. The shrine quest for Kei Ma doesn't require runes, so carry the rock roast up. On the inside, there are spiked balls we can use Magnesis on, but I've never used runes on this shrine and they definitely aren't required. Number 76, Daka Ko. Time to jump off the center block so you can land on a lantern beside the exit door. Wait for it to open again and then hop in. Shea Mosa was designed to be solved without runes, and even the walkthrough tutorials for every chest don't use them, so solve like normal. The blue flame shrine almost stopped me until I found a very small oversight. The spike trap's hitbox in the beginning doesn't completely touch the wall beside it. If you crouch and move along a near pixel perfect line, you could squeeze underneath. And yes, I tried octobaloons, but they weren't viable here. To get access to the blue flame, you can use bomb arrows to position these magnesis steps. Once in place, you can go up and grab the flame, where we now need to carry it across the shrine. You can carry the flame to the first lamp using a torch on the path we made with bomb arrows. For the second torch, we can bypass Cryonis with a well-placed shot. This will unlock another torch, which can also be conveniently hit with an arrow shot. Most of the lanterns past this part can be lit like normal since they don't require runes. The only other one to watch out for is near the end, where you need more bomb arrows to move a magnesis platform. Once it's pushed far enough, you can get the flame over using an arrow, allowing us to carry the flame to the end and complete the shrine. Gore Tor and Zunakai are more blessings than our start in the Akala region. If you picked up a dragon skill when you were in Tabantha's Tanagar Canyon, then Tatsuwa Nima is an easy test of strength. If not, backtrack for it. You can also mark off Kenai Shaka, Da Hesho, and Retag Zuma while you're in the Akala region, as they're all blessings or tests of strength and entered normally. Katosa Og is our next puzzle shrine and has an easy skip. If you shield jump off one of the two lanterns, you can barely clear the gap and pick up Orb 84. We haven't used Octobloons in a bit, and Kamel is an easy one to exploit. Grab the barrel off the scale and put it in the corner next to the monk. Using the power of cheese, we clear another shrine with the spools of some Octo Rocks. Zekasho, the last shrine in Akala. To get past the spikes, shield jump and land on the spikes. If you're lucky, it'll either just damage you or throw you forward. Getting past the lasers is easy, but you'll want to grab skew on the last platform so we can clip to the end. There's probably a way to do the shrine without clipping, but after spending many hours experimenting, I decided to move on. Santa Hodge doesn't normally require runes, so clear like normal by lighting everything on fire. Moakit isn't as tricky as it looks. Eat some two or three tier speed food and you can run past the first rolling ball. If you use a 2 tier like I did, you might get hit, but you'll still have time to get past. 
For the last section, you can crouch and hold tight to the left or right wall to graze past the balls. If they hit you, try reloading the shrine, but I managed to get this one first try in the actual run. Tom Wool can be sawed like normal, with a single requirement of fire. Back to more interesting shrines, let's tackle Sher Rata. Raise the water level by triggering the switch with an arrow. You don't actually need Cryonis to make it across, since Link can climb up the ledge. Aim a bomb arrow to slightly left of the wall, blocking the switch to lower the water level back down. Once the water's down, we can take the barrel and unlock the monk's chamber. Nezioma can be solved a few unique ways, but here is my choice. Run up top to the orb and the pedestal at the top of the shrine. It's possible to get up by performing a wall jump onto the pedestal. Tutorial and comments. Once up, hold some items to push the ball off and onto the ramp nearest the shrine entrance. Once it's down, you can simply roll it to the intended location and unlock the exit to the shrine. Daga Keek requires us to retrieve a trident from underwater. Since we don't have Magnesis, we're going to get Link to dive underwater and pick it up himself. I'll link a tutorial below, but you'll need to set up menu overloading, then begin duplicating weapons and tossing them into the water in the Zora's domain. Once you've duplicated around 200 elemental blades, or more of other weapons, the physics engine should begin acting strangely and you'll be allowed underwater. In order to locate the trident, you may want to move around and try to get a view underneath the water unless you have the location memorized. Once you've retrieved the trident, carry it upwards and slam it into the pedestal to unlock a blessing shrine. We'll grab two quick orbs by completing So Kofi and Namaka Oz, both of which are tests of strength. On to Jolu Na. Complete the test of will quest to make the shrine appear. Once you have an autosave inside, go back out and grab skew, then load back in. The first room is quite simple. Using shock arrows, you can trigger the door to open without the apparatus. The skew we grabbed is for the second room, as the puzzle doesn't interact with anything except an apparatus. Knock the metal chest down in the last room. One of the water spouts can't be stopped without the apparatus, but using this, we don't need it. Hold some items and push the chest up against the wall near the monk. Pull out some octobloons and fly up over the wall to complete number 96. Show Dantu no bomb version. Delete three of the boxes on the left side, but leave one for later. Use bomb arrows to trigger the switches on the left and the right to unlock the main door. Back to that box from earlier. Push it near the exit and octobloon up to bypass the normal bomb requirement. Shout out to a viewer named Nina who helped make the shrine significantly easier than my original solution. Grab a quick orb from Kima Kososa's Guardian, then loose an electric arrow for a second easy orb with a blessing shrine Kiha Yug. Kutakar is our pick for number 100. Just make sure you unequip your flame blade before you pick up and carry the ice block. Carry it to the point that's past the last flame and octobloon it up. You'll need to use some arrows to push it, but nothing too difficult. Now to get Link over there. Run along the main path until you find a metal block in lava. Octobloon it up and glide across. There's another way to get over here, but this method is much easier. Finally, take the block to the exit and Orb 100 is yours. We're about to step away from shrines for a second to deal with the time being stuck at 515, but it's best if we clear the shrines near Hyrule Castle first. If you're following my route, that only leaves three test of strengths, Noya Neha, Kantachuki, and Sas Kosa, all easily cleared with no special requirements. In order to complete this run, we have to get time moving again. Certain shrines can't be entered without the quests involving specific times of days. I spent over 60 hours digging and glitch hunting for ways to restart time since the one known method that would have worked, clipping at a Dark Beast Ganon, was destroyed by a patch that causes NPCs and shrines not to spawn when you save after entering the final fight. Luckily, you can do something similar. Get Skew off of the roof of the doors to Sanctum. If you trigger the Blight fight, you can't normally escape, but I did find one spot you can clip. The boundary doesn't extend to the diagonal walls near the door and using an extended shield clip we can get through. If you uncrouch under the stairs, you'll have escaped the fight while the game thinks you're still in it. During this fight, things like NPCs, shrines, and objects like the Sheikah Slate pedestal will not load. Trek all the way back to the Shrine of Resurrection and trigger the opening cutscene. Normally, the game would force you to pick up the slate during the opening cutscene. However, since we're still in the Ganon fight, the game refuses to load the slate and allows us to trigger the opening without picking it up. Yes, during this entire run, we've never triggered the opening cutscene, and the clock doesn't start until you watch the opening. We still have an issue, though. While you're in this fight state, you can't save. In order to enable saving again, we need to go all the way to Luralin, and unfortunately, while the game thinks you're in the fight, it won't allow you to ride horses. Once you're here, interact with a chest in the gambling minigame to force coin to load. Pick any chest, then stop and call it quits. If you go to a location where a shrine should be, the game will trigger an autosave. 
Loading this autosave will stop the game from thinking we're in the Ganon fight and things will load normally. With time moving again and nothing broken, we can finally continue to the last few shrines. Eventide is nearby and a lot simpler than you might think. Burn the rubble off the first pedestal with some fire choo-choo jelly. Grab an orb for it nearby by stealing it from the Henox, then running away. Once it's in, we'll tackle the one closest to the shrine. Use an octo balloon to clear off the pedestal and grab the orb from the enemy camp beside it. For the last pedestal, we'll take the orb from the boat goblins below. Take it to the shore near the final pedestal and drop it. Near the start of Eventide, there's a raft we can grab. Get it over to the spot where you drop the orb and use it like a bridge to get in without using Cryonis. This will unlock the Blessing Shrine Korgu Chida with no interior puzzle. Now to Ha to Ha Mar, which I was saving since I didn't have a solution at first. I actually found two solutions to this intro section, but the easier one requires us to start by menu overloading. You should be able to hold an item in the menu, but not the overworld if fully overloaded. If you jump and pause, then add another item to what you're holding, you should be able to multi-slash or jump. Chain this neat trick for up to five jump slashes, letting you clear the gap. For the ball at the end, knock it down with the bomb arrow. You can roll it to the end by pushing it, or use a second bomb arrow for added style. Since we started time, we can finally clear out Camera. Go into the rotating chamber and catch one of the platforms as it rotates up. Once it's about halfway, get on the gear in the center. Watch for the staircase to come around and jump on it. Stay on the corner as it rotates and you should be able to move from the side of the stairs to the actual stair. Once there, wait for it to line up with the exit and that's shrine complete. Kaya Wan was the shrine that gave me the most grief in this run. Start by menu overloading and holding an item while desynced like we did in Ha to Hamar. Aim for the little ledge on the side of the shrine entrance. It's precise, but if you can land here, you can clear out your held items and hold another while desynced. Aim slightly right of the center of the elevator and hop up a bit further. Reset your items once more and then multi-jump onto the top of the shrine. This will take a significant amount of retries, it was around 2 hours for me to get it right. The good news is now that you're up, walking to the end only requires one very easy multi-jump, netting us spirit orb number 107. Sumasama is a blitzing shrine that we couldn't get into without the time rolling, but it's now doable since we can move the shadow to the correct position. Pawakoth is one I missed on the map earlier, but we're ready to tackle now. Using electric arrows and multi-shot bows, you can get past the initial door and following platform. The final area I tried a multitude of things on, but wound up needing a clip through the exit. Sasakai was previously locked for us. With time rolling, we can clear this test of strength for an easy orb. Moving on to Gino. The orbs on the first and second conveyors can be knocked into place with an arrow. For the last one, it's not as easy. Throw the ball onto the far conveyor belt. Jump over before it moves too far and position yourself on top of one of the blocks. Throw the ball back across the conveyor before you fall off and jump across. Now we can put the orb in its pedestal and move on. Burita Nog was locked to us before, but not anymore. This one's quite simple. Don't bother with the puzzle, instead jump from the top of the cannon and she'll jump in midair to clear straight to the exit. Number 113, Mija Roki, is another test of strength unlocked by restarting time. Though Caillou is a blessing shrine entered with fire, bringing our counter to 114. For Kemazus, there is a switch to the right of the monk, which is easily triggered by a shock arrow, opening the door to the chamber. We've completed 115 shrines now, and unfortunately the last five are locked behind quests that require runes. Since they aren't loaded, we can't clip into them, and I have spent a significant amount of time trying to glitch into them. After reaching out to the speedrunning community, they came up with a theory of getting into one using something called a BTB to unload the door of a shrine, followed by a shrine coordinate warp. The execution of this is insane as the storage for the SCW needs to be performed within 7-8 to eight seconds of when the shrine body loads into your game, menu time included. I've been able to execute the second portion within the time constraint, but after around 8 hours of attempts while including the BTB, I've decided to go another route. If you have a save file on the other game mode that has unlocked these shrines, you can perform something called wrong warping to get in. I'll link a tutorial, but in short, you set up moon jump, enter the shrine you want to warp to, warp to your travel medallion, hopefully you placed it beforehand, and then return to the title screen and switch modes to your sleetless save file. After you load, simply save and load the save again, and you'll teleport into the shrine from the other mode. This works by transferring a warp coordinate between loads via moon jump, still allowing us to enter while not using the slate on our sleetless save file. Four of the five shrines left are blessings or tests of strength, namely Korsh Ohu, Shoka Teton, Lak Naroki, and Rakazunzo, bumping our counter to 119. The final shrine we wrong warp into is Kaya. On the left side of the shrine, you can write a platform to a button. 
Drop a bundle of wood or something heavy on it and it'll unlock a chest containing a key to our final spirit orb, completing every shrine within the original rules of this challenge. To those of you that would like to see the last five entered without wrong warping, I would love to find a way to do this. However, I've spent over 800 hours on this run and for my sanity I will not be continuing to hunt these five for now. If anyone finds a way to get in, I would love to hear about it and you're welcome to reach out about methods I've tried to get in and what I've discovered. For now, I'm proud of how far I was able to take the game and consider this run a success. I'd like to give a quick shout out to a few of my viewers who helped with ideas and testing, namely Kay, Nina, and Melon. If you enjoyed this video, consider dropping a like, and if you have any questions about any part of the run, I'm more than happy to respond in the comments or via messages. If you'd like to see other never before done challenges, consider subscribing to my channel here, or dropping a follow on Twitch where I stream all my runs live while we figure out whether they're possible or not. I'm Glitch the Box Links, and I'll see you guys in the next Out of the Box Challenge.